So what I, well, yeah, me and Jimmy were just about to start talking. Um, so what I was something I always like like to get into, but I was thinking was important, um, at least for today, was what I was calling cultural conditioning, um, and acknowledging that you know we all grown up in some type of culture, which is broadly we grew up in this in in the same culture that always changes. But then there's like subcultures within that, um, and how that has an effect on us, our worldview, and and ultimately our construct of reality. Really, like, oh, what are we? What are we viewing this experience through? You know, uh, behind these eyes. You know, we're, we're seeing this and we're interpreting this experience through a certain uh, filter of our conditioning. And there's, within that, there's a general story, right? So the general story, we're born, we die. In between that, there's life without a full explanation, but our culture gives us an explanation. You know, modern, like Western culture, well, the explanation is probably broadly a Christian one that would have that religious undertone, but then within our life, we do the, the thing, more like a consumer lifestyle where you, you know, you grow up, you go to school, you graduate, you go to college, you get a you know, relationship, you get married, you find a job, you get a house, you retire, you vacation, and you die. That's you know the physical uh, you know framework of that cultural belief. You know we acquire stuff, we buy new new shit, and we get our car. You know it's always the continual marketing. And even you know you watch TV, the commer- you know commercials. If you watch TV, it's commercial, commercial, commercial. So many commercials, and I and I'm looking at this, and like these commercials are reinforcing a way to live like oh this is the lifestyle this is what you do you get um you know this mortgage you go to this place and eat you get this home security you consume 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 you do this um and i'm not harping on that or even saying anything's wrong i'm just making an example of oh this is our modern day western culture like it's a consumer thing you know we have celebrities that we looked up to and this and that um but often like we don't see that we just say oh well, that's life oh, that's that's life but that's not the case because we're not seeing the conditioning and that's why i think it's important to point out our conditioning or the fact that we're even under or looking at life through a conditioned mind so that we can see how it shows up in our own experience. If there are things that are common throughout, you know, all of all of our conditionings, regardless of what it is, and if we start to break down these layers of conditioning, like within it we have our morality. It's like we do all these things externally, but then there's another layer of like, oh well what's going on while we're doing that? And, and like our morality is there and so we will judge what's going on based a lot on that there's the internal part of it that's happening while that story's going on of you know whatever I was saying before a job car whatever it is then there's our internal part that's happening simultaneously while we're doing whatever we're doing if we start digging underneath those layers um, there comes to the point hello Jimmy, can you grab a different chair, though? Not that one. That one's wobbly. Can you, can you get a different one? Mm-hmm. Put it right here. Okay. You can sit with me to the door. Okay. Welcome. I just read your email last night. Did what? you? Okay, good. I'm glad you're here. Susan? Susan, yeah. Yes. Right. Susan Jimmy Floyd. And your breakfast, you called David. No, that was a typo on a flyer. <laughs> My middle name is David. 
Brad. Her first name is Brad. Yeah. These are the aliens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on the flyer they put Dave and Black and uh, like, oh, he he claims that he has this certification or something like that. I'm like, wait, he claims like I'm lying. So is that your middle name, Brett, or what? No, Brett's my first name. I thought you said your name was David. My middle name. <laughs> oh, your middle name is David. My middle name, Brett David Black. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so on the flyer, I put Brett David Black, mm -hmm. and then when he made it up, he just was going with David. I don't know how that happened. So, so now I know who you are. Now you know who I am. My true identity is revealed. Um, so breaking down this, the, these, this conditioning, whatever. The big common thread, I think, that that's at the like the base, the foundation of our judgment of this experience, is good and evil. Like that's across the board. Like if because there's things that are on top of that, like the a lot of other beliefs that we have about life and about this experience and what it is. There's a lot of stuff because we it continues to build as we go on. But if we start wiping away something that's very deeply like embedded and ingrained at the very like surface level is that idea, that truth. I think even like synonymous with almost life and death, good and evil is very much at the core of all of our um, beliefs and our conditioning. Right? We don't often look at that, acknowledge that, or even know that because it's just, oh, well, it's so assumed because it's so deep and everyone is doing that. I'm not saying that it doesn't have a play in all of this, but I'm saying that um, it's there as an, like a given idea that's accepted and then you, we judge all of this with that that being um okay, can I say something? yeah okay before she came would you um you, you said that we're thrown into this type of society that we're living in is it what you said something like that oh well, i didn't say thrown into but let's let's see what you like what like the um, the modern world you mentioned the, uh -huh. the modern yeah, world. like a western society yeah yeah well, my question or my perceiving of it is different generations like me me and jim's generations as opposed to my grandchildren's generations like we're all into this the same mode like you said with the um commercials you said about the the way we may perceive it or the way my parents perceived what's going on today if it's it's a different uh, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a different way of uh, like getting into how we're going to deal with what you're what you're saying the, the good and the bad, whatever it is. Because uh, we w we always have the choice. Either we can sit back and listen to like you said all these commercials that are some way trying to influence someone to, to be a certain way, or, or or maybe go out and buy a certain thing because we like you said we hear these commercials, commercials, commercials. Now me and I could even speak for Jim. That just goes in one ear out the other because it's not going to influence me by listening to a commercial to either buy this project product over that product or whatever because we we have the some people I, I feel I have the insight to look to look through that you know and not be mind controlled by the media but I like you said some people look up to these celebrities or they worship these celebrities you said that mm -hmm. I mean. To me, my mind is has got to be focused, and like in between life and death, like you said, in between life and death, to me, it's just one thing, and that's the main thing is, is survival. Now, how we sur how we survive between life and death is is each individual's uh, way of doing it. So that, that's why I wanted to just put that out there. Like I may I may see things differently than she does, but I don't know what her generation is. If she's, you know, my age, I'm I'm 65, going on 66. You know, I'm still within his his generation. He, 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 he's an old man, but uh, you know, he's only a few years older than me. But um, you know, I'm trying to say the way my grandkids will will be thrown into or, or be a part of this society, modern society, is going to be a lot different 20, 30 years from now. The way they see things, right? Yeah. 
And so the see that's exactly what I'm getting at. It's not see I I used our modern Western culture as an example. It really has what I'm really talking about. I'm not even really um, discussing the, so much the culture, but I'm pointing out. See, especially okay, you're you're actually a great example of this because of your Native American ties, and so you have a from the average person, you have a vastly different uh, worldview and outlook on this because your culture is different from that modern Western culture. And we can take all different cultures from all over the world, from different time periods, or even just the same period, geographically, how people were raised and conditioned, and they will all have a different idea about what life and what this experience is. We could agree. Okay. Like, okay, within my culture, let's say, um, specifically the, the part of me that's Native American. Now, that's there's a diversity even amongst, let's say, uh, indigenous natives that live in Arizona mm -hmm. or New Mexico. You know, the, most of them are still what we, what you would uh, refer to as full full bloods, and they have they have within their own culture, let's say, certain wor worships or ceremonies that they do. Uh, most of the the natives on the e Eastern tribe, like I'm talking about. New York, uh, New Jersey, the ones that were first exposed to the Europeans. You know, like we were the, my, my tribe, Lenape's and Iroquois and, and the ones down south, the one before they got removed to Oklahoma, we were exposed to the Europeans and we got mixed with them. So within my own Native American culture, amongst my tribe, we have diversities because some of the people in, in my tribe, even though they have, you know, they're on the register, out, outwardly, outwardly, they some of my people in my tribe prefer themselves to be black. Some of them prefer themselves to be outwardly as white, and other ones like like myself, I, I I embrace my my indigenous culture. Doesn't matter what my skin color is, it's what my beliefs my beliefs are spiritually. I, I believe in you know great spirit and and that. So my so my my thing is even with my own tribe, there's <laughs> diversity within that. Because a lot of my people like they're they're just for whatever reasons, from from uh, centuries and centuries of being degenocide, and assimilated, and stereotyped, you know, they like to sit home at their computer and get on the Facebook or something, and yeah, they'll be in, they'll be Indian then, they'll be Native American then, or or they, they want a, a card to, to register them on the tribe. They'll sit behind their their computer with their mouse and look at all of the, all the things that us guys on the front line are doing, but when it comes to time for them to actually get off their ass and, and come out and go to a, a ceremony or, or, or be involved in a powwow, if they do come out, they'll stand back in the shadows and they're like, you know, like a good example, when we first started doing that uh, publicly, we were doing powwows, I'm 15, 20 years ago. Some of my people who were more white looking now, when it, when we started doing the powwows, and we knew they were the same names, they had the same last names. Some of us were brown skin, some of us were dark brown skin, some of them were white looking. But when they came out, the light, the white ones, when they came out to our powwows, guess what? They were wearing cowboy hats and cowboy boots. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> so, the, so here, uh, the, well, this and again, this is reiterating where I'm trying to get to. I think going off a little bit in a direction but yeah. there's an identity there's an identification with a story mm -hmm. and the story is influenced by the culture see I'm not even really trying to really get on culture and say well which one's right or which one's wrong yeah. or even judge right. it but the fact that there's an identification with our beliefs which are heavily influenced by the cultures that we are affected by but where the point that I'm attempting to address is that that identification point and how once we identify fully with a structure of thoughts and beliefs, now we we kind of 
we put ourselves in a box as far as our access and understanding to what this experience actually is. The experience does not get to be alive and organic and express itself for what it is because we take our belief system and we superimpose it over this experience. So now, if, if I grew up in, um, say, a village that the, the way the culture was demonstrated was that at manhood, I would have to, by, at, at this point in my life, say by the time I turned 16, all the men in the village learn how to walk on their hands and they walk out into the ocean and drown and then they move on to, to their real, you know, the real life. I would do that believing that that's what this experience was because that's the, how I was brought up and I, it'd be so ingrained into my belief system, I would think that's what this is and that's what we do. And that's why I gave the example of the Western culture and I said all those things. I really don't, like whatever, whatever any culture is, it is, and that's fine for what it is, but I'm trying to get before our cultural conditioning and see that we are viewing this experience through the lens of our own personal cultural conditioning, which extends out to you know the society and the time that it happened and the place, but we're all under that influence. All four of us, have a different idea about this based on our conditioning throughout our life and throughout the lives of the people who came before us that helped to bring us through this and helped to show us and tell us what this is. A couple of weeks ago, this is a good example, and this is something that really uh, showed itself clearly to me. My niece, um, she's in first grade, and she's, uh, she learned this song and the song goes through all the months of the year. I don't know how the melody, but January, February, March, whatever. So she's trying to remember the song and trying to put it together, and she's getting the months confused and whatnot. And so my mom and I were like, all right, you know, January, and then what come, what's in January, whatever, New Year's, and then February, Valentine's Day, and then whose birthday, and we're teaching her January, February, March, April, blah, blah, blah. And she's kind of not really putting it together, not grasping it. And this, this, in the moment, it hits me. We are, in this moment, attempting to condition this child to believe in something that's actually not even true. There is no such thing as January, February, March, April, May, blah, blah. That is a construct that humans came up with to label, you could say, the passing of the moons, but f for different, different purposes. But there is no repeating January and February and March. You know, I was attempting to lay this on top of her as if I was telling her something that was true, like, oh, you don't understand the truth of this yet. The truth of this is that there's January, February, March, April. No, there actually isn't. I believe that there is because I don't really, I won't much take time to think about it and acknowledge the fact that that was put into my system as a child and we work through this experience based on that being a common belief that we all accept and that's fine for us to move around and navigate through this with those. But there, we take those months, we break them down into days and weeks, like I expect there's, that there's going to be a next Saturday. And, I, and my mind automatically breaks up this experience in, through seven days a week. And I think that there's repeating Saturdays that happen every time, you know, four times within a month, maybe five. But that's not true. There's no such thing as a repeating day. Days don't repeat. It's not real. But my conditioning that's happened for so long, it's so deep that it's like, it seems that, that what I said seems obvious, but it's not because my conditioning is forever moving and it just it, it keeps it's like it's on autopilot so I navigate through this experience with that just being a given like oh of course it's Saturday of course but not knowing m more truly what's going on because I don't see it this is a big reason like what these what these talks are about is to 
point out and to see the aspects of this experience that are overlooked because they are so deeply ingrained in our psyche that they're just they're glossed over and we wouldn't think anything different. Because in actuality, there's only a, there's only the present. There's, there's no there's no uh, past or, or future. There's only there's only the present. So, like you said, so we're living in the present, but because someone told us when we were little, like your niece, that oh, this is Saturday or this is Valentine's Day or this is it's your birthday. That's not. You're absolutely right. It's it's just. The continuum is, the universe is just, just is. It just is, right. See, and that's the thing. See, and we, we can bring this up, right? We can, we can acknowledge, okay, we, it's the, we only have the present moment. It just is. But we don't walk, that, this is, we don't walk through life embodying that because we get lost in our conditioning. Mm -hmm. And so this just is, but I'm walking around saying it's this. But really, it just is. So, and I feel like that's why this right now is important. Because if we, like, when's the last time, you know, we sat down and, like, acknowledged, wait a minute, I'm living through, uh, you know, this filter of a lot of bullshit. Like, it doesn't happen often. So if we continue to speak about this and look at these things that we overlook, maybe we can come to a point where there's a shift and we see full time that it just is and then we can we can navigate with what we think you know the other thing like oh i get it i understand i'm super this is being superimposed but in reality it's it is just what it is without you know the story being secondary versus cuz we're coming from the story being primary like oh okay yeah i know there's no such thing as a tuesday but when I go back to autopilot, I'm going to believe in Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. So, so it's, it's more nurture, nurture sting. That's the right word. Nurture, nurturing. Okay. I like that word though. Nurture sting. I'm going <laughs> to. <laughs> so it appears to be more nurture, nurturing to um, your spirit and your psyche if you, if you embrace that type of uh, concept. It's, I mean, from being, you know, knowing that you're tuned in to what's what's. Uh, I use the word natural, as opposed to knowing that, like I said, this coming to Monday, use the word Monday, right? let's say for example, knowing Monday that I better pay my car insurance by Monday, if not, my, my car insurance is gonna be whatever, uh, re revoked, revoked, so I'm, now I'm living back in that type of situation because it's, it's the conditioning, knowing that if I don't pay that car insurance, I'm not gonna be legally able to drive my car. But if I can, sit back and say, well, I'm not going to die, I'm not going to, uh, you know, uh, get terminally ill by not paying my car insurance, and I tune back into that universal concept of, of just is or the present, I'm like, okay, I might be able to, it's not going to affect me as bad. You know what I'm trying to say? Some people worry, worry, worry about this, they worry, worry, worry about that, and it affects them physically. Now, if I can get into that concept where why worry about it and uh, tune into that universal of just being, being is, it's, I think it's, it's, it's nurturing to my psyche and my, and my spirit. So we are navigating a shared experience. Navigate, that word, navigate, in, yeah. in that shared experience, there are obligations. There's a way that this works. I would, I'm going to pay my car insurance on Monday if it's due on Monday. Matter of fact, I'm going to pay it the previous, you know, Tuesday before it even comes up. I don't want to make this any more difficult than it is. And I don't want, I'm not discounting what is happening here. But there's a game that's being played. And within that game, there's rules to that game. And this game is a conceptual game. See, like you were talking about going back to the concept of just being universally here and acknowledging that all we do is now. But see, because that's why I was saying about us coming from the wrong side. See, we're coming from concept, coming from a place of concept, looking at what is versus to continue 
to point out our space of concept that we are viewing what is from, if we see eventually that, okay, I am, I am experiencing life through my own concept of what it is, hopefully at some point there'll be a switch where now I'm embodied in the now seeing the concepts arising secondary. We are seeing this life, this experience as the concepts primary. If, that be, if they become secondary, I would have no stress knowing that, oh, I have to, I have to pay this, or I have to go here, or I have to show up to court, blah, 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 all those things, because I'm, oh, these are just, it's just the game that we're all playing. And I would know that without getting wrapped up, because see, with all of the, the, the shared game that we're playing, our psyche attaches to that, and, and depending on the way that we deal with life and situations, we could be more neurotic about things, we could be more chill about things, depending on our personality, but then that colors our, our experience. Well, like you said, some people get very much worried about this, that, and the other. That's the way they deal with things. But if they were in a space of realizing, oh, it's, it's just eternally now, and I'm in the midst of this experience where there's this this thing going on where we do this, that, and the other within this culture. This is how we operate. Knowing that I'm here, all of that other stuff, yeah, oh, I'll dot the, the I's and cross the T's, but it's not this life or death situation that our mind can attach to it. And then you get all stressed out and you said that there's physical ailments, this, that, and the other. So I, I like, I'm, 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 I'm in agreement with what you said, but um, it, it just, and it was perfect too, because it demonstrates, um, and, and particularly when you said, oh yeah, go back to the concept of, you know, like universally now. That appears to be the before concept arises, pre-concepts, is universally now, universally now being overlooked because we are living through concepts. And I don't to, I don't have anything to say so much about what universally now is because I don't know but I am aware of me, what I call me. I have, I'm aware that this experience is being narrated by a conceptual movement that labels and judges and already has this concrete picture of life and that my belief and identification in that that movement, that psychological m movement that has prejudged this, all of that prejudgment, and then so the prejudgment being what I already think this experience is and then the judgment that arises in the moment. So when things come and go within the prejudged experience, things come and go and then I'm judging them again. Judgment on top of judgment doesn't allow for what is to be what it is. I can see that clearly. It's almost like I'm using the even, see, and I'm using the word prejudge, which is what prejudice comes from. And we all know, so if, if, pre, if we're prejudiced against anything, typically that comes down to race, you would not get to know a person for who or what they are because your prejudice would um, forbid you from being able to see them because you would, as soon as they walked in, there would be that all these labels and ideas and judgments placed on them, then that's how you would see them. You would never see anything about them because of that prejudice. We are prejudiced towards this entire experience. Not in that way of where it's you know necessarily negative the way we use the word prejudice, but we, we've already have it prejudged. We already have this whole thing concluded. Like, okay, you know, then they, 
it's it, this is what it is. It's fact that this life is this. If there's a fact that is set in stone, you know, how can there even be a chance for um, expression or movement? Uh, because once something is black and white, and that's all you see is black and white, you have no concept for gray because it, that black and white becomes so solid. And this experience is so much more gray than black and white. And that black and white could turn good, evil, yin, yang, male, female, blah, blah, blah. So, no, that's a good point about, um, you said the prejudice, right? Well, I, I see that as the, the, flip side of, the flip side of that, or let's say what you just said is heads, I can, the, the tail sides of that, the way I see that is how the individual perceives what someone else is going to um, think about them. You, you, know, you know what I'm trying to say? It, it's like, you said when, when let's say uh, someone's prejudiced against, let's say, um, somebody eating donuts, <laughs> okay? Good. So a, a person walks in the door and they can't stand to see someone eating donuts and it sets them off, right? That's from that person that came in the room. Now from the person that's actually eating the donuts, his, inside him, he's thinking, oh, I know there's somebody out here that's not gonna like me eating these donuts. You see, so that would be the flip side of the other person as, a, as opposed to the other person thinking what this other person is gonna think about it. Well, they're both doing the same thing, though. Because the guy who's coming in with the donuts, thinking, oh, there's going to be somebody who's not going to like them eating these donuts, he's prejudging the experience as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, see, that's the thing. We're all doing that, but from different directions. Angles, yeah. So it, it, see, and that, it doesn't matter what the story is on the surface. It matter, it's the mechanism underneath the story. You know, it's like the, the if we all had... Um, uh, we were, it was a painting class and we all had four canvases or we all had one each we could all paint whatever picture we wanted but underneath that we all had the same canvas and that same canvas still exists which is it's a, it's a clean slate yeah because of the way we were conditioned but right so that's what we have to see that we are viewing this through this painted picture you know that that we're all, ours is, you know, they're all separate, but there's, the unity is still within that. that. That eternal now, that universal eternal now, is like that blank canvas, and we are looking at that, that blank canvas though, but we're only seeing the paint of the picture that we continue to paint. That painting is influenced by our cultural conditioning and our identification with that and with ourself. We, we will believe that life and this experience is the painting we see. If we can see the painting, or if we can see the paint within the painting, then we can acknowledge the canvas underneath. We don't see the canvas, so we can't really talk about the canvas, but if we can identify the paint of this experience, then we would realize, oh, it's just a painting. Really what's going on is that what really is, but I am approaching it from the paint. The paint is only relative to me and, and my unique ball of conditioning is painting this picture. This picture. That's pretty, pretty heavy, man. <laughs> see, <laughs> the now this is where it, so the belief. What that's you know what that's a great question. I would normally say Earth, right? Huh. Where'd that come from? Not say, I'm not even going to go that far. But, If, if we could follow that painting thing, which might be a little, a little bit much, but that 
painted view of this experience, we can paint um, a nightmare, a comedy, a drama, and the painting changes all the time. We do go through the nightmare, the comedy, the drama, this, that, and the other. But the identification in, and the, the very heavily ingrained belief we believe what our, our thoughts and emotions and judgments about this experience, which is what I'm getting at with the paint. The paint is what we believe and, and, our, and our judgment of it. The fact that we believe it so to be, to be truth. See, we believe it to be true. If, if someone walked in this room and said something that personally offended me, which would be, which would be they said in something that was in opposition to my belief system, I would really think, I would believe that they said something wrong. You know, if I love pineapple, that's like my favorite food in the entire, forget about fruit, my favorite fruit in this entire planet. And they were like, pineapple is disgusting, it's the worst thing that, that, that if it ever was created, I wish it never existed. I might take personal offense to that and think this this person's a jerk that he's saying things that are wrong and I would and and I would I can I can become angry and my emotional state would become all agitated and I would have this thing because I would believe that he truly said something wrong because I believe in the thoughts and emotions that are hooked into the conditioning that I have created an identification with. That conditioning and that identification being that pineapple's the best thing. He said something in, in opposition to it, so now I'm agitated, I have a problem, and my whole experience of this is, is thrown off. That mechanism that is, have, has these beliefs, that's how we experience discomfort and agitation throughout this whole thing because when life shows up in opposition to the belief structure that I have set up regardless of the situation it could be sitting in traffic it could be a rainy day it could, any little thing that goes in, in contrast to what I want in the moment will make this present moment now seem uncomfortable because now I'm painting a negative picture in the moment because I believe in this absolute, I believe my relative truth to be an absolute truth. I feel like I'm going a little bit um, too far without slowing down. and. That brings me to um, a, a quote that I wrote when I started this meetup group. And it, w it is that there are, on this planet right now, there's like seven and a half billion people, something to that. So there'd be seven and a half billion relative truths. None of those seven and a half billion relative truths can be absolutely true but absolute truth exists. This bit of silence we have right here, I think is a great example of that. I'm sitting here um, spouting these concepts and this relative truth and then we can't deny that, that silence. You can't dispute it, but there's nothing to debate about it. None of us have a personal silence. What I'm putting into this silence is up for debate. 
and um, can be wrong cannot be there's there's potential for it to not be true I'll give you a summary of what you basically what you're talking about when I grew up before you <laughs> I was told that George Washington never told a lie he chopped down a cherry tree and he said I chopped down a cherry tree I was told the Indians were the bad people. You know how long and old I was before I found out it was all bullshit. <coughs> old man. So I'm thinking what you're saying. There's programmers out there. They take us when they're young. Think about it. For six years, you were your parents. They're telling you things. But usually it's things that they were told. So the program becomes a programmer. And most people, a lot of people stay that way all their life. You go there, you go school. You're programmed by a teacher. The teacher's programmed by the programmer. They have to teach a curriculum. You leave there, you either go to service or you go to work or you go to college. And when we get back to generations of you were talking about Before, say, uh, 1920s, most people didn't even go to college. They went to grade school, and then they went out and worked. And they, uh, what do you call it, they trade. Father's trade, their trade, or something called a trade. There was very little higher education. The wars come along, people go to war. And that's when things started changing. Those guys get back from World War II, or World War I, they're called the lost generation because they come back into society. What was taught to them as being real and as bullshit. And World War II came along. Father away from our values. And the Korean War, Vietnam. And now we have a generation of seekers. I don't like saying this, but I grew up in the drug culture of the 60s. One thing became that was good was the yang part of the yin. LSD and mind altering drugs made people realize there was something more in reality than this. And today, Esoteric people the it goes back to uh, I mean, this woman's cooking a ham because the end of the ham and her daughter says Ma why are you doing that she says because grandma used to do it So he, she asked Grandma, why do I cut the, off the ham? Well, she said, when I grew up, that pants weren't big enough. 
You don't have to do that now. But we just do it without thinking. You're a thinker. I'm a thinker. That's why we're here. You're absolutely right. There is an ultimate truth. It's taken me a lifetime to unravel the damage that was done to me when I was young. The lies I was told. You can see it in families. I've noticed in families. Including me. There are cults. Most families are cults. Everybody has a role. And you start going outside that role. Right away you're attacked. Anything different. I don't want to bring politics into this, but this is what Trump has to deal with. He thinks totally out of the box, totally different than anybody else. And he's being attacked for it. Whether he's right or wrong, that's nothing to do with it. And that's the way the dark forces work. Mm -hmm. Anything that tries to get out of that program is going to be attacked. Well, see, because we're, we're going off. It's, this, the, the, this is, okay, here's an example of what the, the mind does this. We're going off back into the story of our conditioning. We just went through a, a display of a certain explanation of what's going on and what's been going on. Our mind does that. It attaches to the story that it believes about how this experience is, how it's been, where it's going, these past and future ideas. There's always going to be conditioning in whatever degree. We have to, we can't, we can't play this game of life that we're playing without a belief in our conditioning. If we all, from, the, in, from day one, from, if we always all just knew of eternal now and that was it, and, and there, wasn't, there wasn't these other things, then we would have never went, we, there would be no journey. There'd be no us going through all of these things and emotional, mental attachments. You can't have an emotional response to something that you're not attached to. We wouldn't have had an experience. Jimmy just gave a great example of a worldview and, I, and an idea and a summary of what's going on in this through his personal conditioning and the evolution of it. It's not really conditioning with me, it's experience. Well, that's where our ex conditioning comes through our experience. But my concepts are conditioned. My, I understand what you're saying. But as a free spirit, they can condition my mind and my body, but they can't condition my soul. Well, yes, because we would, we would identify our soul with that present now. He's a prime example. He's really into the uh, Indian heritage. I admire it. Don't know much about it, but I admire it. Well, Taoism. I mean, see, I, I have this. Bring up. I have. I have this thing where to let me see, quote, reality. Like he said. Like like Bruce said. There's there's no January. There's no February. There's no March. But I know for a fact there is light and darkness. That's the truth I deal with, and not just be, within Native, my Native American culture. Well, I can't when I search for answers and search for this and that, and, I, and for some reason I stumble and I can't get what I want from my Native American culture. I go into my Taoism, you know, my Tai Chi, and I have to bring it back to square one and go, wait a minute, I'm I'm getting too confused. I got to bring it back to reality. Is it part of the light or is it part of the dark? And what Brett was starting to say earlier about the good and bad. But that you didn't let me finish. Now here he is, this is he's above a lot of people. I can say that because well, that's just a label. <laughs> Floyd was in the service. You conformed, right? Got through the service. That, yeah, yeah, conformity was throwing a break. <laughs> you worked. You worked out. You worked in society for many, many years. Yeah, worked corrections. Worked in. Um... But yet, you still had that inner. 
concept is beyond. Oh yeah, I got in trouble a lot of times because of my own whether it was either military or the corrections so or, or, or whatever, whatever job I worked, I, w I would have to face, I would have to confront my soul or my spirit. Said, wait a minute, this, this is the format, this is the way it's laid out, this is the way it's written, this is the rule. But then something inside me go, wait a minute, they, they, they can't. This, they can't fool me just so far. That's because you're getting out of the program. Yeah, they couldn't program me only no, so the far. programmers were attacking you, say damn to me. Yeah, they only could program me just so far, you know. If, if we were walking out of the forest right now <coughs> and we were following the straight line that we all saw, like this is how we get out of the forest, but along that straight path to get out of the forest, there was all these other little offshoots that could take us around and keep us in the forest. Our identifications will take us to those offshoots. There is, when we speak of the aspects of ourself that we find, that we enjoy and find to be noble and um, higher or above, we, we will start to feel good about them and we will follow those trails that keep us in the woods and forget that I was walking out of the woods, but now I'm remembering my, uh, my Kung Fu practice and, and what it told me. And instead of me walking out of the woods, I'm now getting wrapped up in my perception and my identification with my Kung Fu practice, but my Kung Fu practice the whole time is trying to tell me to go straight out, follow that straight line, but I'm wrapped up in the practice, so I'm going to go follow this and I'm going to forget because I'm going to keep spouting around and get lost in my concepts when the, the conceptual aspect of the thing that I'm practicing, if it's not pushing, pointing me out of the woods, then I'm getting lost. Stuff in the maze, right? Do you do you guys remember? I don't know if you know Bruce Lee. I know you guys did. You remember Enter the Dragon? In the beginning of that movie, he's he's training one of the kids, and he's trying to keep, teach the kid something. And he says something to the effect of, um, "It's like a finger pointing its way to the heavens." He's like, "Don't get wrapped up in the finger." or you will, you will miss all its heavenly glory, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. The concept of the things that we take pride in, see, and I don't, there's no intention of, of offending anyone. You know, and I'm just gonna use your example because we were talking about the, the Taoism and the, um, your Native American culture. Taoism is pointing at the truth. From a true Taoist perspective, they would say there's no such thing as Taoism. No. But we believe and will identify in my Taoist beliefs, and that will keep me from what the Taoism was meant to do in the first place, was to show me there's no such thing really, and it's that. But we need, the way we're doing this, we need something, we need a concept to grab onto to show us if we get caught up in with the finger, we then we're, we're looking at the finger versus the finger's pointing me right through, down the straight path out the door, but I'm sitting here staring at the finger. Where's the finger going? There, it's not right here. This isn't the point. This finger is all of our stories that we are spouting. The, like we could get lost, like when, you know. Floyd said um, his piece, Jimmy said his, and like I as watching, it's like, oh, we are falling back into the story of our conditioning, and we constantly bounce it off of each other, you know? That's like following that offshoot in the woods. We do, and that's what I'm saying, we don't see it because it happens so often and so frequent, and for so long, we just believe that's what it is. We become believed in the finger because you can dress this finger up. You can put the most beautiful robes, clean it up, get it polished and all that. I'm like, oh, wow, this is great. Look at this. And the whole, my whole life I could spend like looking at this finger. And then one day I'm like, what, wait, what is this finger? What is it? What, oh, it's pointing there. 
and I go like that. I'm like, are you serious? Holy shit. The answer to everything was right there. I stared at this finger for 85 years and all I had to do was, the finger was actually just pointing the whole time and now I finally looked because I wasn't so mesmerized and believed in the finger. Now I see what the, actually what it represented. With that, um, we have to be out of here. Um, Susan, did you have anything that you, that you want to say or no? no? <laughs> he still didn't know what play. <laughs> I'll let you know when I figure it out. The moral of the story is that is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Suck your thumb, don't suck your fingers. Yeah. <laughs> suck your thumb, don't suck yes. your fingers. <laughs>